All right, I think I'm gonna get moving as people trickle in. I don't think we don't miss the good stuff for a minute here, so we should be good. Uh, thank you everybody for joining. I'm, I'm super excited for this workshop. I think it's gonna be very uh, fun. Uh, what we're gonna be going through today is we're actually gonna build a movie recommender system uh, using Tekton and Snowflake. Um, recommendation systems just end up being one of the more tricky and complex machine learning systems that I work with on the day to day. And I thought it'd be cool to see how we can uh, sort of iteratively build one and hopefully reduce the complexity of those systems. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping as we get started. Um, the code that I'm going to be using today is available at this GitHub repository. I posted a link to that in the Slack channel for this workshop. Uh, you can check out the repository here. There's a ton of stuff in here. We're only going to cover a fraction of it today, but if you want to poke around, a lot of it you'll be able to run yourself. Some of it is uh, you'll need Tekton for, so it won't be easy, but um, yeah, please poke around, follow along, uh, and check it out. And then any questions you have throughout, uh, please throw them in this workshop channel uh, in the Tekton fee Slack. I have a couple of very appreciated helpers that will be in there answering questions. A teammate of mine, Eddie, is here, and Miles from Snowflake is also here. So if you have any Snowflake questions, Tekton questions, uh, fire them away in this chat and, and we'll get to it. And I'm also going to leave time at the end to answer any interactive questions. As I said, there's a ton of content we're not going to cover. So if there's something you want to see, something you want to dive deeper into, I'm happy to do that at the end. Uh, so let's get into this. What we're going to do is build a movie recommender system. And uh, I think this is probably something that most folks are familiar with. Uh, you log into your favorite streaming service. And what do you see? It's a list of curated content that's trying to predict uh, what you specifically are going to like based on your preferences and your historical behavior and things like that. And these systems uh, frequently get built up from very, very simple systems into incredibly complex, large scale things. And I want to walk us through the journey of what that looks like. And, uh, and in particular, we're going to step through three sort of stages of maturity of a recommendation system today. Stage one, we're going to be basically doing, uh, in the machine learning world, all batch inference. So basically what that's going to look like is once a day, we're going to compute a static set of recommendations to show to every user. We're then going to progress to the fat point where we have the ability to dynamically create new recommendations. So maybe someone you just finished watching a movie and we want to uh, show some new recommendations to you. Um, we're going to build that. And then we're going to sort of like step through the architecture of how we can start to build even more complexity in by adding real time data into the mix and the ability to process real time data. Uh, but before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's take a peek at what we're actually building. So I've got uh, the first really simple website, and, and I apologize in advance. I'm many things in life, but I'm certainly not a designer. So websites built by me are going to be the ugliest demos you've seen in your life. Uh, but this first website is just showing us recommendations for one user. So we flip through between users, we get a list of what movies we think I'm going to like today. Um, and where we're going to go through this presentation is we're going to take this website that we've got built and we're going to take the journey to a website that looks more like this, where if I'm some user and I just watched Toy Story, uh, we can get predictions of what other movies I might like to watch next for Scott Lord of the Rings. And, uh, it's a really simple change to the website, but it's a really complicated, uh, change to the back end where we're going to move from pre-computing everything up front to actually doing real-time machine learning at a pretty large scale uh, to be able to build the system. Uh, I'm going to step through like every single piece of this system. So uh, buckle in, we've got a lot of content to cover and I am really excited for it. So uh, let's start with that existing batch recommendation system and I'm going to walk you through what we've got today. Um, first thing I want to do is step through the existing architecture at a high level, then we're going to zoom into all the components. So to start, we're going to use uh, data that we have in Snowflake. 
Snowflake, for any number of reasons, is a great engine to do this on. Uh, it obviously all of the convenience of working with it, but also the ability to scale is going to be really important as we as the workload gets bigger and bigger. Uh, we're going to use machine learning for this recommendation system, and to power the features for machine learning, we're going to use Tecton. So Tecton, uh, if you don't know by the end of apply, uh, this might be the first talk you come to, but it's a feature platform for machine learning, and it's going to help us turn that raw data in Snowflake into the features that we need for machine learning. Uh, next thing we're going to do is train a machine learning model. There are a ton of approaches to modeling for recommendation systems. I already see something in the chat asking about if we're doing collaborative filtering or content-based. Um, I'm actually going to be using a deep learning system that uh, I guess you could say does a little bit of both, um, a hybrid approach. So uh, we'll be looking at historical interactions and a whole bunch of stuff, but uh, we'll dive into the exact deep learning system I'm building uh, in this call. Once we train a model, we're going to basically perform batch inference. So we're going to pass some inference data into that model. Uh, we're going to write out the predictions to a Snowflake table. That's going to result in recommendations that we're actually going to use Tecton to ingest because we then need to serve those recommendations out to some sort of backend so we can render a website that looks like this. And so to recap that in super fast form, we're gonna take data, build features, train a machine learning model, and then on some schedule do batch inference to pre-compute recommendations that will serve to our website. Uh, okay, let's zoom into all these components, get a feel for how they come together because we're gonna reuse most of this as we build that real-time system that we're about to get to. So um, the data itself, as I mentioned, is in Snowflake. And we really have two primary data sources we're going to use for this problem. Probably the most important is this ratings information. Uh, we have a whole bunch of records where some user rated a movie between one to five at some point in time in the past. Uh, and, and this lets us sort of get a sense for users' preferences and uh, also by comparing the ways that users interact with movies, it gets us a sense of what movies are like and, and how movies are related. We also have some just raw data about the movies. So for every movie, we've got the title, some of the genres it's associated with, and its release date. So this is the raw data we're working with. and. Um, yeah, the next thing we need to do is actually take that raw data and turn it into something that we can uh, use in machine learning. And uh, I'm going to show you the features we built in Tecton for this uh, actually live or in a demo. So I'm going to head over to Tecton really quick and just show you how we've used Tecton to turn that raw data into a couple of different simple features. Um, in this demo, I wanted to keep it really simple. So I didn't go crazy with the features. I only have a handful built. Uh, I want to highlight two in particular, just to show you the types of things we can do. The first one is some information about the genre of movies. So uh, if you remember from looking at our raw data, uh, that genre column is this sort of obnoxious string pipe separated of genres. And this is not great for uh, use in a machine learning model. So this feature basically takes that string and turns it into something a little bit more workable. It basically one hot encodes if a movie is one or more of these genres. Uh, and I guess to show you in practice what's happening here, I've got this big SQL query that just says, hey, does that genre string contain these various substrings? Uh, that one hot encodes it. And then Tecton is basically like orchestrating this Snowflake SQL query I wrote to compute these features. Uh, and we'll query this for training, inference, a whole bunch of stuff down the line. Other feature I want to call out is um, a series of features I built that tell us about a user's historical interactions with movies of a specific type of genre. So. Uh, in this example, I have like basically the average rating that a user has given sci-fi movies over some time window. And in this case, for simplicity, I just have one time window 
the last two years. So we're looking at across the last two years, uh, what's the average rating a user has given sci-fi movies? And this gives us maybe like a slightly richer sense of a user's taste without having to completely learn that. Again, uh, a simple Snowflake query is used to compose this. Uh, and one of the nice things that's happening in Tekton here is Tekton actually has built-in aggregations for these really common window aggregations. So many features in machine learning are like counting something that happened in the last some amount of time. And to help support that, Tekton has a built-in function for doing this type of aggregate. So we're just taking the mean over two years of data uh, where a user interacted with sci-fi movies. So that's my really simple set of features that we're gonna use in Tekton. Uh, let's keep stepping through this architecture now. Uh, the next thing is training a model. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not gonna go into how I actually train this model today. Uh, I know that's probably a popular topic, but there, we could go into a whole can of worms for this. Uh, but I will say, I use this model architecture called TabNet. It's a, um, a deep learning architecture that is built specifically for working on tabular data. I've used it with a lot of success in the past. Um, and the code that you actually can see, if you wanna step through and, and see how to actually train this, uh, there's a notebook in the code repository that I shared. I actually see a link in the chat. Um, if you head to the Slack channel for this uh, workshop, you'll find uh, a couple messages ago, I posted the code and you can pop open this repository and Eddie shared it, appreciate it. So yeah, um, this notebook called train tab net uh, notebook will walk through how we use, generate training data, how we actually train the model. Uh, feel free to take a peek, but I guess for the sake of this talk and for time, just know we trained a model here and uh, stored the output. And so the next thing we need to build is the inference pipeline. Uh, just to explode this out a little bit, uh, basically what we're gonna do is orchestrate it so that once a day, we pipe in some features for scoring to that tree and tabnet model. That computes these predicted ratings. We're actually gonna write those out to Snowflake. You'll see in, I have another notebook here that talks about inference. So you'll see we use a lot of the convenience of the Snowflake Python connector to do this. And what actually gets persisted in Snowflake looks like this. We've got uh, basically for each user movie combo, we predict the rating that that user will give that movie. So then the recommendations that come out of this are basically just like sorting the top 50 uh, movies per user based on the predicted rating that we give them. So big batch inference problem where we have to make a prediction for every user in every movie. But once we do that, we can get a ranked list. And that's those recommendations that we're gonna use that we saw in the demo website a second ago. And just to reiterate the pipeline then that runs every day here is we grab features from Tekton, train a model, uh, store these predicted writing, ratings back to Snowflake, and then uh, we're actually gonna ingest those into Tekton. Tekton's gonna schedule a job to consume these predicted ratings to actually make those uh, predictions available for our website. Uh, I guess one thing to call out, one thing you won't find in the code repository that I have is the actual orchestration layer of this. It's not implemented in this. Uh, lots of tools that people use for this type of thing though, like Airflow, or Kubeflow or whatever uh, workflow orchestration tool you prefer. So um, yeah, by all means, uh, learn and experiment with orchestration, but it's one thing you aren't gonna find in the repo. All right, and then the last piece is basically this recommendations backend. It's the piece that when we actually go to the website, uh, it hits some endpoints so that we can retrieve the recommendations for a user. And uh, what that actually looks like is our website makes a call to the backend. It says, hey, this user just browsed the website. That backend actually calls out to Tekton and says, please give me those pre-computed recommendations. Tekton sends those back. And then uh, the backend sends that to Tekton to actually render the web page. 
or sorry, the backend sends it to the, to the front end to render the web page. Uh, the code for that looks like this. I built a really simple Flask application. Um, the Flask application does exactly what I just said. It basically composes a HTTP request to talk to Tekton. Tekton sends back a list of movies that we recommend to a user. It serializes those out and ships it back to the front end. And uh, that's everything we covered. The raw data, how we're turning it into features, the model that we're training, the batch inference pipeline, and this back end. And those are the components that add up to being able to render for every user uh, what movies we recommend to them that given day. And now I want to actually like step through the, uh, the, the fun part of this presentation where we're going to go into a lot more detail and code. And let's actually build out the stage two uh, advanced level recommendation system. And so here's where we're gonna actually go to, if a user has just watched a movie, recommending a set of movies for them um, that they might also like. And this has a ton of extra complexity in it. In this, we're gonna be doing real-time inference uh, at really large scale with a lot of data. Um, it can be a really daunting task. I work with a lot of teams that it's a really daunting task for, but I hope in this workshop, we're going to be able to break it out into a series of sort of simple steps and uh, see how they can all come together. So to get started, I just want to call or go through um, a quick overview of how real-time recommendation systems are typically laid out. So if I just watched this movie Ex Machina, uh, the website might call out to our back end that's about to be a, a big overhaul and say, hey, David Hershey just watched this movie. That's going to pass through three stages to actually generate uh, these recommendations for me. The first one is called candidate generation. So you can imagine if we're trying to imagine what movies to show the user next, uh, the world of possibilities is every movie ever created. Um, that ends up just being too big of a data problem. You can't make a prediction for every movie ever created, for every user, for every page. It's too big. And so candidate generation is responsible for sampling down from the world of every possible movie to a smaller list of decent candidates that we might want to show the user. Next step is filtering. Um, filtering is used to just filter out uh, obviously bad suggestions. An example could be if a user has just finished watching uh, some movie, maybe we might want, you may want to filter that out. Or if uh, you know a child is browsing, we may want to filter out adult content, that kind of thing. Then the last step is to actually make a prediction about all of those candidates. So in the case of movies, we're going to basically say, what is the rating that we guess that the user is going to give each one of those possible movies? And then we'll rank those in order. And the thing that we want the user to click on the most is the thing that we think they're going to rate the highest. Uh, that takes the form of these recommendations that lets us render our web page. And the thing I really want to call out and highlight here is each one of these steps in its own way depends on really fast access to data. Um, they're very like in their own different types of data, but they require real-time data. And Tekton is really a, a tool that is built to be able to service getting real-time data to these various stages. So we're gonna depend on Tekton for this. And I just want to step through the different types of data that's going to flow into each stage. Uh, for candidate generation, I'm going to get into more detail about what I mean by movie nearest neighbors in a second. But basically, we're going to get uh, some information about Tekton about the most similar movies to the movie the user just watched. For filtering, Tekton can provide us a list of the movies that the user has watched recently um, and do that quickly. And then maybe the, the biggest one is when we actually want to score our model. So we're gonna have you know, a thousand candidates at the end of this pipeline. Uh, we need to retrieve the features that we use to train our model for each one of those thousand candidate movies. And so Tekton's actually gonna need to provide like a thousand 
feature vectors, one for each one of these candidates that got through uh, to our ranking system so that then our, our prediction system, our ML model can actually uh, make predictions about the ratings we think the user will give each model. So uh, each one of these is a real-time data problem. And this last one is a really large scale real-time data problem. Uh, it's, it's a particularly gnarly one, uh, but we'll show you how this works and how we can optimize this even too. All right, uh, last bit of slides before we get into the, the nitty gritty code. I wanna walk through the architecture of what we're gonna end up building with this new system. So just like before, we're going to rely on Snowflake as the primary source for data. We, uh, you'll notice, have added a new table here about movie correlations. And that's because we're going to use uh, information about how correlated movies are to uh, generate candidates. I mentioned before, the candidates for a movie that I just watched are going to be the 100 most similar movies to that, uh, to that movie. And we'll get into detail and demo how I'm generating this in a minute. That data still is going to flow into Tecton. We're still going to build features. In fact, for this real-time system, I'm going to use that exact same list of features I used to do the offline system. We're going to make no changes to that. Same with training. Uh, I'm actually going to use like the literal exact trained model object. I don't need to make any changes. That model takes in features about a movie and a user and generates a prediction about the rating that the uh, user will give that movie. And that's all we need. First big change is now, instead of doing batch inference, we're going to have to actually host our model as an endpoint somewhere. So we're going to need to do model serving. Uh, I'll show you how we pulled that off um, in a simple way for this demo. And then the last really major change is the recommendations backend. Uh, if you remember before, the back end was just calling Tecton to get uh, recommendations. But now this back end is going to have to implement that whole three part system I talked about candidate generation, filtering, and ranking. So uh, this is going to get a big overhaul as it uh, implements all of that. Uh, but let's get into this. I want to walk through uh, four different pieces that need to come together to make this real time system possible. Uh, first thing I want to touch on is Tecton. So one thing we need to do is have access to all of those features that we built in real time. Um, so if we head back here, we'll remember the features that we were focused in on were this genre info and uh, these average ratings that users have given specific genres. And the good news about the fact that we use Tecton to build these in the first place is they are already online. What do I mean by that? Well, as soon as I defined these features to Tecton, uh, it started moving all of that data, running all of those queries in Snowflake, and, and taking that data and putting it somewhere where we could access it in real time. In this case, I'm using DynamoDB as a backend. But what that means is all of those features that I used to train the model, the ones I used for batch inference just a minute ago, they're also available and getting updated constantly in DynamoDB so that I can retrieve them in real time. So the answer to how do I get features available online uh, is I don't have to do anything. Tecton already took care of it. Um, this is something we kind of get to ignore because we define everything in Tecton up front. So uh, that's nice. It skipped one of the major complexities of these systems for us. Um, we'll show how we can retrieve things from it in a second. Uh, but before we get there, let's move on to this nearest neighbors thing that I've been hinting at. So uh, I told you before that the way that we're going to do candidate generation is by basically generating a list of the most similar movies to a movie that, um, like to the current movie that I used to just watched. And so two questions basically come out of that. Uh, one is how do I define similar? What does similar mean in the form of a movie like this? And two is how are we going to compute all of that? Um, so let's answer one first. It's out of order on this notebook, but uh, that's okay. My to generate like a similarity metric matrix, I basically have created a really really big matrix that defines the uh, interactions between every single user and every single movie. So if I look at a row here, it's saying this user gave a rating of four to movie one. 
and a zero means they didn't give it any rating. And that means these columns are basically representations of the movie in terms of what users interacted with them and rated them. And uh, what I can do with this information is basically if I treat each one of these columns as a vector that uh, summarizes like what users think about a movie, uh, by doing the similarity between any one column, like the column describing movie one and the, screw, the column describing movie one, zero, 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 one, uh, that gives me some sense of um, similarity. Now, the problem when there are 20,000 rows, that means these vectors are like 20,000 dimensional. Um, so this is actually a pretty big computational problem. And because of that, I'm going to use this really nifty library from the folks, folks at Spotify called Annoy that does approximate nearest neighbors. Um, Approximate nearest neighbors basically like helps us approximate the similarity between every single one of these vectors in vector space. Uh, and why approximate is nice is it happens really fast. So that means I can very quickly uh, estimate what the closest and most similar movies are to any one of the existing movies. Behind the scenes, what we actually do here is we train this approximate nearest neighbors model uh, it builds some like actual tree models to um, to represent this space. And then we write that out. And then if we head over to the inference notebook, we could do the fun part and actually generate these lists of um, how similar movies are. So let's do this. Let's load it up. Um, I am going to load up that trained nearest neighbors model, as well as a little bit of info about the data set so that we can actually render movies. And now uh, I can actually run this. So I'm going to do this get nearest neighbors of one. Uh, movie one is Toy Story. So let's run to do this. Um, we can see what comes back, and it looks pretty sensible. The most similar movies are Toy Story 2, Toy Story 3, uh, Monsters Inc., Finding Nemo. Sounds about right. Uh, just to show what I mean by fast and that this wasn't canned, we can type in any one of these now and very quickly look up the nearest neighbors. Um, very quickly can vary. It can be uh, milliseconds up to about a second, uh, but it, it's fast enough. And in particular, it's fast enough to basically like run this function looping over every single movie every day. So now that I have this function built, all I need to do pre-computed nearest neighbors is basically write a for loop that loops over all of the movies and predicts the 100 nearest neighbors of each one of those movies. And then last thing I'm going to do is write those predictions out to Snowflake uh, using the Python or the Python Snowflake connector. And if I poke over to Snowflake, I can show you what this looks like. Uh, I have this table called Movie Nearest Neighbors now, and it has a list of all the movies. and than an array of the nearest neighbors to those movies. So uh, this information is what we're gonna use for candidate generation. When I am trying to decide what are the possible set of movies I should show me after I just finished watching movie 54001, we're gonna look up this exact information and use that as the candidates. And again, uh, online, like in our application, we're not gonna query Snowflake directly. Uh, we're going to load this stuff into Tecton so that we can query it uh, way faster. And that is it for nearest neighbors. Uh, two steps down, let's move on to step three. Uh, and that's this model endpoint concept. So uh, because we're making predictions online, we actually need some service who's responsible for uh, invoking the model against features to make predictions. Um, I'm sure since you've all been at this conference all weekend, you're aware of this problem and all of the many, many solutions to this problem. Uh, but I just wanna show you my really dirt simple implementation for demo purposes. Uh, and it's just running as a Flask app. It's actually running on my laptop live right now. And it's basically this um, really simple thing that instantiates a model by loading the model artifact. Um, You'll notice I'm doing a whole bunch of things poorly, like not using a model registry 
and not keeping track of metadata and all of that, copying around files. But uh, I'll leave that to someone else's talk to tell you about all the, the smart ways to manage this information. Um, but given we're not doing that, this just basically instantiates the model. And then it has a handy predict function that pre-processes some data and calculates some predictions on that data. And then I have a route on my Flask app that basically takes in a data frame as input, makes some predictions, and uh, sends back those predictions to whatever the calling service was. This is it. Obviously, this is like the simplest approach to model inference you could possibly take. Uh, if you need to scale this up, you're going to need to deal with parallelism and, and uh, then maybe either vendor solutions or going to a Kubernetes-based system or something makes sense. But uh, for this demo, uh, this works great. And then uh, the last beautiful thing that we have to implement is this backend. Uh, this is really where the meat of the implementation is going to lie. Um, we need to update that app backend to do this whole thing that we talked about. Candidate generation, uh, filtering, and ranking. Oh, got ahead of myself. Uh, so I actually have a notebook here in the sample code that I shared that walks through each one of these steps and how we're going to do it. Uh, let me pop through here. The first three are just set up, but basically what I'm going to step through is uh, one sample of what it looks like to do this. Uh, we're going to make predictions for this user if they just watched Toy Story 1. So uh, let's get started. First thing we've got here is candidate generation. And if you remember, uh, our approach to candidate generation is just to look up the list of 100 most similar movies. To do this, I'm just going to call Tecton. We ingested that uh, nearest neighbor data into Tecton. And so again, I just make basically like a REST call out to the Tecton serving endpoint. That's going to send me back a list of, of candidates. And if we run this, we get back a list of candidates. And one neat thing we can do here just to, to check our own work is, uh, you know, these are the most similar movies to Toy Story 1. Back in this notebook, we were just playing with the most similar movies to Toy Story 1. So if I run this function that we have, uh, we get that list. And so we can see the movie should be 3114 and 78499. And if we pop back here, that's what we're getting. So obviously running two very different ways. This notebook is calling a approximate nearest neighbors model. This notebook, we're actually making a REST call to Tecton to serve out this pre-computed array. Uh, but we get the same answer back, which is great. And uh, notably, the nice thing about this is uh, it's very performant. This is a, a handful of milliseconds type of API, and uh, it's very scalable. So uh, calculating this nearest neighbors model at scale would require some big scaled system. Uh, doing this in Tecton, it's a managed service. Uh, if I send 5,000 requests a second to this, it's just going to scale out and, and handle this. Uh, so that's why we're really doing like this pre-computing step. Next step is filtering. Um, so again, if you remember our filtering approach, what we want to do is look up the most recent movies that a user has watched and make sure we filter out the can from the candidates any movies that the user has already watched recently. Uh, same thing is true. I basically wrote a feature in Tecton that is the movies a user most recently watched. And so I'm going to call out to Tecton one more time here to get a list of the movies that were recently watched by a user. And then if they have watched those movies, I basically am going to do set subtraction. I have the set of candidates and I'm going to subtract out the set of recently watched movies. And what comes out is a filtered list of candidates. And in this case, it looks like um, my user hadn't watched any of these movies recently. So we get the exact same list back. OK, now the, uh, the crown jewel here is ranking. Uh, this is by far the most complex part of this because it involves a lot of systems. So I want to step through it in a diagram before we pull out this whole thing. So. Um, 
the first thing to know is what's coming into ranking is this list of filtered candidates. And the first thing we needed to do is basically like enrich this list of candidates and turn it into a list of feature vectors. Again, we need to pass this into our ML model. So we need to retrieve those exact same features that we use to train the model. Uh, so what that's gonna look like is we're actually gonna make one request to Tecton for each one of these candidates. So in total, a hundred requests that are gonna get us back 100 feature vectors. Uh, each one of these could be different. In fact, they likely will, since this is a hundred different movies, we're gonna get different genre information for all 100. Um, and so once we have those 100 feature vectors, then we can actually start making our prediction. What we're gonna do in practice is actually serialize them, like create a data frame, serialize that data frame and send it off to that model endpoint that we built. And that's gonna shoot back ratings. Uh, so basically for each one of these candidates, what rating do we think the user is gonna give it? Last step is to rank those. That's just a sort, we're gonna sort by rating. And uh, what's gonna come out is recommendations. So let's look at what this looks like in code and then run it. Uh, here is the, the good part. Yeah, this steps through that whole thing. So step one, you get feature vectors. Let's take a look at that. Uh, what that does is basically get a feature vector for each user ID, movie ID pair. So again, user ID is static. It's whoever's browsing to the page, but the movie ID is every single candidate that we've generated. Um, that individual get feature vector call does the same thing we've seen twice or three times now already. It reaches out to Tecton and says, hey, for this user and this movie and the feature service that we're using, uh, that is all of the features that our model expects. Can I please get back all of those features? Uh, Tecton serializes those all back into some features and we get back a feature vector. So at the end of this call, I have a list of 100 feature vectors. Uh, and then I'm gonna turn that into a data frame. The reason I'm gonna turn it into a data frame is it's sort of the structure that our model expects to be working with. Um, data frame is going to have like the right schema applied and the right versions applied. Uh, to actually apply the right schema and, and typing, I actually, I hit it up here, but one of the first things I did was actually reach out to the metadata API of Tecton to get the schema of this feature service. And so, you know, basically like when I start up my application, I can look up the expected schema of the data that we're gonna be sending to the model. I apply that schema to these feature vectors that I got. And then um, once I have this data frame built, and I'm gonna, when I run this, we'll see the data frame of features actually print out, so I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, but the next thing we're gonna do is basically take that data frame and go get predictions. What get predictions does is basically serialize the data frame to a string and ship it off to that uh, serving endpoint that we created. It's gonna get back predicted ratings for each movie. And then uh, we'll print all that out and see what happens. So I'm gonna call this, uh, the first thing you're gonna notice is this is gonna take a while. Uh, not a long while, but it took like a little bit more than a second. And before I get into showing you what the stuff looked like, the reason it took a second is because I did a for loop over a hundred requests to Tecton and made a hundred HTTP requests back to back to back. Uh, it's not very efficient. We'll talk about how to optimize that in a second. Um, but let's actually look at some of the pieces here. So uh, first one is the feature data frame. This is the thing we passed into our model for inference. And uh, we can see those exact features that we define in Tecton. We have those one hot encodings of uh, information about a movie genre, which is neat. And then we have information about the historical ratings that a user has given to uh, different genres. So, um, You'll notice here that uh, the user ID is obviously fixed for all of these, but the movie changes. And so this genre information is changing across each different candidate. Uh, but this information about the user's historical favor or uh, behavior is static across each one of these. So this is the data that got serialized off and sent to the model. 
And then what came back is our predictions. So we have, you know, we think the movie from those that list that the user will like the most is Shawshank Redemption. Our model predicted that it would give a rating of 4.57 to that movie uh, and so on and so forth. And that's really it. That's, that's how this thing is implemented. Uh, at least component wise, we, you know, just to run through this really fast again, uh, generate candidates, filter them, and then do ranking. And you'll notice by far the, the least efficient component here right now is ranking. Uh, and so I guess the, the last thing I want to touch on in code is how do we improve this? How do, how do I speed up ranking? And really the short answer is just you have to build a more efficient client than this serial one that I built to make these HTTP requests. And so uh, how do you do that? Uh, I don't claim to have built the world's fastest client here, uh, but it's really easy to speed it up by just doing parallelism. So I basically made git feature vector a asynchronous call, and I have this task that basically uh, makes all of those 100 calls to getting feature vectors in parallel. That does most of the trick. This, this speeds it up from taking a couple of seconds to taking 100 milliseconds or so, uh, pretty quick. So this is the actual, you, you can see this in the, the repository. Uh, it's in all of these services that I've been looking at are in the services folder. Uh, and so this is this client and implementation of the recommend next route is all here. And this is what's gonna get used by this backend here. So when I flip between here, you'll see that all these predictions are pretty, pretty snappy. Um, we're able to very quickly predict what movie to show someone. So uh, that's the joy of writing a more performant client, uh, really important piece of doing this. Uh, but now we have this really cool system. Uh, just to unpack, like, now that you've seen all of the stuff behind the scenes, every time I click this button, we are doing candidate generation by making a call to Tecton to look up 100 movies that we think they might like. We're doing filtering. And then we're passing that all to an ML model in real time. And all this is just running on my laptop right now. Uh, I, I, maybe I'm tooting my own horn, but I, I just think it's like uh, very cool that we can orchestrate this much complex infrastructure, uh, basically working out of a Jupyter notebook. I, I find this to be uh, kind of amazing. Um, all right, so that's it. That's our application. Let's, uh, let's head back to slides and uh, take one more step down the path of where we can go from here. How does this get to that next level? How do we become Netflix or Amazon with product rankings? Uh, well, just to recap, this is what we have today now. So what we've built is Snowflake uh, that provides data into Tekton for features. We train a model and then we built this crazy backend that does all that stuff that I just talked about. Uh, but the real next step, the place to go from here, are um, taking in real-time data, basically. So right now, all of these features that I computed are things like, um, what are the user's historical rating for movies in the last two years? But what's more important, actually, when you build really good recommendations is what was the users, what the users spend the most time looking at in the last 30 seconds or two minutes or something like that. If you're browsing Amazon and you're staring at, uh, you know, new stickers for your wall or something, uh, then that's probably what you're interested in more than the generic list of things we thought we were interested in yesterday. And what do you need for that? You need to basically uh, incorporate real time data into your machine learning model. And so stepping through, a lot of this looks exactly the same. You can still use the same historical data, you can still train a model, make an endpoint. Um, all of this is about the same, but the new thing that happens is we need to ingest real-time usage data and we need to compute fresh features. And you know, most everything else gets to stay static, but now we just need to find some way to process this real-time data into features very quickly so that our backend, and in particular, our model can make decisions based on uh, very real-time information. 
And I'm not going to have, you know, we've got 15 minutes left. Uh, it's not the point of today's demo, but the short version of this is um, Tecton is really set up to be able to handle this real time data without a lot of the, the pain that typically comes up with setting up these types of systems. So whether that's just directly popping uh, data from your application into Tecton, or whether it's Tecton listening or consuming data from a streaming source like Kafka, whatever works, uh, you know, Tecton can sort of use this logic that you wrote to generate features to generate features off of that real time data and make these avail features available very quickly. So now instead of this feature about what genre, like what rating has a user given a genre in the last two years, I can have a feature like uh, what genre has gotten the most screen time for a user in the last five minutes. And that's the really powerful sort of step function past what we built that enables you to uh, build really great recommendation systems. That's, that's where you start encroaching on uh, Netflix and Amazon and people like that. And the good news is it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's another incremental step if you have the right tools. If you don't have the right tools, it's not. If you, if you have to go set up Kafka and then like manage streaming pipelines like Flink or Spark streaming or something on your own, uh, this is a big, big step. This is a completely new thing. But uh, you know, Tecton is really there to help smooth out this next step so that uh, you can have tooling to, to process this in real time. And that's really what I love about this demo and why I'm passionate about Tecton is in this, we've managed to sort of gracefully flow through um, three stages of complexity. Uh, and, and in it, we've made really minimal changes to our architecture. So we started with this batch system that um, was computing uh, pre-computed recommendations once a day. And with a similar architecture, we were able to just basically overhaul our backend, make a modal endpoint, and immediately start serving out real-time inference to, uh, to be able to do something like predict the next movie that someone should watch. And then it really just takes one last piece, uh, factoring in real-time usage data that Tecton is sort of built in, equipped to automatically process uh, to be able to take that next step into building uh, real-time recommendation systems. Um, all right, so that is all of the, the content from this uh, workshop. Uh, we've got 12 minutes left before I transition over to Q&A. Uh, I have to make one quick plug, which is to say, um, it's first and foremost, Tecton is hiring. So uh, if this kind of stuff excites you, if you like working with these types of architectures and solving these types of problems, uh, in particular, I'm going to pitch that we're hiring solutions architects. Uh, Eddie and I are both solutions architects here. Our job is to sit here with lots of people in the field every day who are trying to build systems like this. It's super rewarding. Uh, please reach out or uh, head to tecton.ai.com careers if you are interested. Uh, and then my slightly shameless uh, plug on the other side, if any of this was exciting for you on the Tecton front, uh, head to our website, request a trial. Uh, maybe we can see if there's something we can work on together. Uh, and so with that, um, I want to open up the floor to questions. Uh, I'm going to attempt to monitor both Zoom slut chat and Slack chat. Um, and I, um, I'm happy, you know, I, I zoomed through a lot of this content, uh, and I, I am happy to, to dive in if there's anything, uh, from training the model inference, anything else you want to see in more detail. So, uh, yeah, please, please shoot me things and I'm happy to go. Okay, so inside my demo on, I, and I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go in order, but I'm just going to read out questions as I get them. Uh, inside my demo on the website, I have Python code on there. Can I explain that again? And how can we test that code? Yeah, heck yeah. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, these websites are are just written in, in very bad JavaScript because I'm not a, a website developer. And then each one of them uh, calls out to a series of backends that's implemented in the services folder. So uh, there were three different 
backend components that we looked at. There was the component that implements the uh, batch recommendations backend. And this one calls out to Tecton to look up pre-computed recommendations. Uh, and I should say all of these are flask apps. The second one is the inference endpoint. Uh, this one instantiates our model and uh, you know, makes predictions if you hit that endpoint with a data frame. Uh, and the last one is the real-time endpoint that has uh, um, basically recommend the next movie. A couple of these, one of these is easy to run. This, this Flask app for the model is easy to run yourself. It has no dependencies on Tecton. Unfortunately, the other ones are gonna do nothing because you need to have a, uh, a Tecton deployment working behind the scenes. Oh, I, the Tecton page. Uh, was it this one that you meant? I, sorry, this is harder in uh, Zoom chat than, uh, yeah, cool, perfect. So uh, these features themselves, that's a great question. Um, you know, they require, actually running this requires Tecton. Um, nothing here is really incredibly fancy. This data is um, you know, sitting in Snowflake. So if I look at this query, uh, you know, I can head over to, to Snowflake. Uh, this is, for example, that genre feature that I have. And I can just run this directly in Snowflake. This is the exact same code I had for Tecton. Um, to actually do the Tecton side of things, you need Tecton. Uh, go to tecton.ai and check that out. I'm happy to chat. Um, and I guess one thing, if you're curious about like the layer that happens to take this query from Snowflake and turn it into a feature, there's a repo here, uh, feature repo. And this contains the implementation of those features. So that genre rating feature I had, uh, wrong one, that genre info feature that I had that I was just looking at. Here's that same query, but turned into a feature view in Tecton. Uh, I don't have nearly enough time to give you a demo of how all of this works in the next seven minutes, but uh, it's implemented here. Feel free to poke around. Uh, I see a question from Eugene up here. Oh, it looks like uh, Eddie, Eddie sent a blog, but uh, you know, we've scaled Dynamo up to a really large scale. We've scaled Redis up to a really large scale. A lot of this is managed behind the scenes. So um, the, the neat thing is you hopefully don't need to worry too much about that offline or that online storage side of things. Um, yeah. Uh, Tecton Feast question, why are the features strings instead of callables? Uh, I'm curious like if you're talking about what I had open here, this uh, string of the uh, of the, the SQL code. And if so, uh, yeah, so I guess this is just like actual SQL and it's wrapped in this function and this decorator called a batch feature view. At the end of the day, this gets executed as SQL. So, um, you know, this basically goes over and actually runs a query in Snowflake uh, to, to represent this data. So, you know, actually, if I pop it open, I have the, uh, I don't have access, doesn't matter. Um, but Tecton actually like registers a view of this feature to, uh, to Snowflake that uses that exact SQL code. And yeah, when you, when you poke over to the UI, uh, looks exactly the same. So if I if I look at that exact same feature here, um, we have that exact same Python function copy over here. See a hand raised. I'm happy if you're if you're interested in uh, actually like speaking your question out. I'm happy to unmute you, uh, Tiziana. So uh, maybe uh, just poke uh, before I force you to talk in front of everybody. Feel free to send me a message in chat saying you're cool with that. I'm happy to unmute you. Uh, in the meanwhile, I, I see a question: Does this work for BigQuery? 
And Tenton's not yet built on top of BigQuery. We are planning to come to GCP and natively support BigQuery in the future. So uh, feel free to reach out and we can tell you more about that, but uh, not available today. Really good question about at what point do we recommend using Redis instead of other backends? Um, and I really think there are two factors that tend to lead teams to use Redis. So uh, the best thing about Dynamo is how little you need to think about it. Uh, it's a fully managed service. It, it works very well up to some scale. Uh, Redis is better typically in two things. Uh, a lot of times it costs less and it has way better uh, latency performance in particularly um, or in particular, it's tail latency performance is way better. So actually most of the folks that we work with that are using like recommendation systems like this, especially at scale, end up going to Redis. You talk about those like fan outs to retrieve features for hundred candidates and tail latency is really important. So the only way to get uh, P99 on a thousand candidates of 50 milliseconds is to use Redis. And, and that's typically what leads people down that route. Maybe you also have some other really low latency requirement. So if you're doing a fraud system and you need to get features in one millisecond instead of 20. Uh, Redis is a great solution for that too. A uh, question from Yoon about uh, ways to define features and yeah, everybody is is sort of uh, different in terms of how they define these, and and I totally hear that. Uh, there's pros and cons of every method of defining this. You know, like I guess one of the pros of Tecton's approach is I actually was able to like write features in a for loop to loop over all of those different genre features, which is neat. Um, but that's not for everybody. Uh, I actually have seen, we have a, a prototype of a working DBT integration where we can just point directly at a, uh, a DBT model. Uh, and I expect that to be something that comes in the future to tech on to you, but for now, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I guess stuck with, with these uh, strings. Uh, you know, I think it's relatively straightforward and readable for most folks. So uh, as long as you can build a standard, I think the standard is probably the most important thing. Then a question with Redis on high concurrency requests. What's the max throughput of concurrency you've run Redis with for a few milliseconds latency? Um, you know, Redis, if you're willing to scale up to large enough size, can handle really high throughput. So depending on the number of shards you're willing to provision, you can, you can go pretty high throughput. Uh, we've tested at nearly like, I think 500,000 queries per second uh, total. Uh, so that's like 500 feature vectors per second. And it is functional. Um, and you know, I, th I think that like, uh, no reason to believe it couldn't scale past that too. And uh, for Dynamo, uh, it really can scale pretty similarly well. I actually think Dynamo's scaling capabilities are some of the best part of it. Uh, I think the biggest and hardest thing about scaling Dynamo to that scale is actually cost. Uh, it's pretty expensive to run Dynamo at uh, hundreds of thousands of queries per second. Um, I, I'm aware of organizations that do it because it's worth it, uh, but I think at some point the managed service becomes less valuable once you're spending millions and millions of dollars a year on, on storage infrastructure. It might make sense to, to hire a few engineers for that cost instead, I guess. So uh, that's a trade-off that some people factor in, but yeah, I've had uh, pretty good experience with Dynamo. The one thing I'll say still is obviously like they offer a P99 of hundred milliseconds. So depending on whether or not that's acceptable is just another piece that, that matters. Okay, I, I know we're up on time here. I really appreciate the questions, they're great. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the chat. Uh, as I said, please check out the code. Um, if you have any questions, reach out to me in the Feast uh, Tecton Slack. You can feel free to DM me or Eddie or anybody here, we're happy to help out. Uh, it's been really fun to build a demo. So yeah, I, I, I uh, hope you all enjoy it. Uh, I guess I'll sneak in one last question here for online features where you're pulling hundreds or thousands of features. Uh, yeah, I think it typically makes sense to do Redis.
And let me uh, see if I can share a link to this channel uh, in the chat so that people can find it. The channel name is here. And the link is, I don't know how to share a link. This is actually an interesting question. Uh, I'm gonna try to share this link. Who knows if that actually works, but cross your fingers. If not, uh, the Tecton fleece Slack is available from tecton.ai. And uh, if you join from there and go to the apply conference workshop three Tecton, uh, that works. I will also post these slides in the uh, apply general channel. And I will, um, yeah, from those slides, you'll be able to link out to this code in case you haven't been able to find it yet. So uh, feel free to poke around. Anyway, take care, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. Really appreciate it. And I, uh, yeah, hopefully we can chat in Slack sometime. Take care.